All right, all right, all right. Let's get this stream up and running so I can just jump straight in and just kick this off today. Hi everyone, my name is Leif Wallace. Welcome to Wallace TV. And on this channel, I share with you advice, tools, and motivation to help you become a better designer. And today I want to speak about will AI replace product designers, or you could say, will AI replace UX designers, UI designers, specifically us that work in tech. We want to break it down and I want to share with you some key things as we go forward and we talk about this today. But as we're about to start, I've got some key things I want to just break down to you. So one of the key things we're going to talk about today are specifically design salaries and how our salaries are kind of mapped out and working out right now. The second thing we're going to be speaking about is how you can stay ahead as a designer and what are the key things you can do to help you ste uh, step out into the marketplace. The third thing we're going to break down is something which I call, uh, not I call, I should say, is something which we call uh, skill stacking. And this is the ability to stack your skills and be able to have skills that reflect your core areas of expertise and interest over time. So as we jump straight in today, I want to go straight in um, and kick it off. Fundamentally, will AI replace us as product designers? And let's start specifically first talking about design salaries and how that makes sense for us today. So as I jump in, I kind of want to open up this spreadsheet first and show you specifically kind of what's happening now. Uh, let's talk about the UK um, and how our salaries are kind of being played out. And when you look what's happening across the industry and to whoever created this spreadsheet, this is not my spreadsheet, by the way, guys, a spreadsheet that I found through being a part of a tech design community. Uh, thank you so much to those who created this. So I'm not taking a, any glory at all <laughs> from putting all this information together, but it gives you a kind of rough estimation as to like in the industry, see like lead product designer, 20,000, that just doesn't make any sense. But it's like in the industry, there's like some real inconsistency between job title and pay. Like in other words, job title and amount and the amount you get paid. It really does depend to like location, where you're based, your ability to negotiate, your ability to ask for how you ask for what you ask for, what you bring to the table, your prior experience, etc. So if you look, for example, on the right hand side, you can kind of see the company size and the amount they're spending. So in other words, small companies don't have a, as much bigger budgets, so they're spending less. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit more, you might see the same junior role, but the company size is a bit larger, but at 50,000. So your junior designer in this context may put 50,000, a junior designer in a much larger, larger organization, a thousand plus at 40,000, 35, 40,000. That's kind of what I've seen in my industry, in my career. Um, also, you might see like a mid-size senior product designer, 37,000. I've seen way more than that for product designers, senior designers, even up to 70, 80, 90,000 plus. So what happens in the industry is, and what I'm seeing is that specifically when young designers are coming into industry, you may be around that 25,000 mark, you know, 27,000 mark uh, and 40,000. So that kind of would be a rough starting salary. Now it depends where you go. Do you choose to go to a startup? Do you choose to go to a big corporate? Most of the time as a junior designer, you're just trying to get your first role. So personally, in my opinion, I wouldn't so much worry about salary <clears throat> as much as does the salary cover your ex basic expenses? Will you be able to travel? Will you be able to live? We live in a time of high inflation. And as a result, many designers are making choices to have side hustles. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well a bit later. But what we're seeing is that as you grow in your career, don't worry so much about the titles at junior level, right? Whether it's digital designer, product designer, uh, lead um, design, um, what we call it, design associate. Some companies may use that term. Most of the time it's like UX designer, UI designer, UX UI designer, product designer, junior product designer. It's like the titles always fluctuate in the industry because there's not real consistency there. But roughly you tend to find junior as a label before the product designer role or UX designer. So junior UX designer, junior product designer, junior UI, junior UX UI. <laughs> but junior tends to normally be there in bigger organizations. Now, what we also find is if I go higher up the salary banding, uh, this term product designer, right? Uh, you can see where the term product designer 
can be someone who's a junior and also someone that's at that mid-level. So this is kind of like your mid-level product designer salary, anywhere between a roughly about 50, 55,000 to about 70,000. Like it depends on the organization. I'm just going off my own personal experience, what I've seen in the past and also what I've kind of seen in, even in um, sometimes when you're recruiting for certain roles and things like that. Now, what happens at this kind of level is you've, what happens as a designer is that you've got to get better at learning how to negotiate your salary and your ability to negotiate your salary is one of your strongest skill sets that you have as you grow now not just to negotiate your salary right because negotiating your salary is one thing but what you got to pay attention to is how you negotiate from job to job uh there's a fantastic article here on calzamias.com calzamias.com and um, it's it's a it's a big article. It's going to take you about a good ten minutes to go through everything. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've done the, the duty of kind of summarizing the kind of key points. So one of the key things you want to understand is that n number one thing: don't give a number first. So like when you're negotiating your salary, the first thing you don't want to pay attention to is like uh, oh, so, so the recruit recruiter says, "Hey, um, you know, so what salary are you looking for?" Well, you could, you could kind of come back and say, hey, well, I'd love to see if I'm a good fit for this organization. And I'd, it'd be good to know what have you paid for this role before in the past? And they may or may not give a number. If they don't give a number, they say, oh, no, we just love to know what you charge. Well, you could always push back and say, you know, what? I just want to make sure I'm a good fit and make sure that, you know, you are hiring A players because I want to work at a company that hires A players. So what do you normally pay your A players <laughs> kind of thing? So it's the kind of obviously speak in your own voice. Um, and this article breaks it down better than I can because uh, negotiating is something that I'm still getting better at, even though I've been in the industry 12 years plus, it's still something I'm getting better at day, uh, year on year. But it's something that this article breaks down very, very thoroughly. I don't even want to do it in injustice. If you want a link to this, go to the description box and I'll add this link in the description box as well uh, and if you want a copy of this uh, spreadsheet then literally send me an email to hello at leifwallace.com hello at leifwallace.com send me an email and i'll shoot this over to you as well so what we see here is this breakdown of like different salary banding different ways to look at what you get paid um, as designers and then as you go up the ranks uh, from head of design lead product designer senior product designer Senior, lead, and head of, depending upon industry size, sorry, company size, the industry you're in, you can have different roles in regards to name. So it could be a senior in healthcare, a lead in entertainment, and a head of design, but you're working for the government. But the head of design working for the government is getting paid way less than the lead that might be working in entertainment or finance, for example, right? So the industry you're in also can impact the pay that you get as well. Now, when you're a junior designer and you're growing in your career, one of the key things you want to pay attention to is what industry can I over time start to specialize in? Now, as a designer, um, it's good to, at a younger age, get as much experience across, mul across multiple industries as much as you can. Um, but one thing that really helps you as you grow in your career is your ability to specialize right now it doesn't mean that you have one skill as a designer and we're going to talk about skill stacking but it means that you have a generalist skill set but you have a t-shaped skill uh, skill set to who you are and i can go into that as well if you love it uh, but fundamentally what you're doing is you're making sure that you have deep knowledge in one area but you have a broad set of skills across uh, multiple different areas as well so if i just type that in just so you understand what i mean when we talk about the T-shaped designer, it's, uh, uh, this, design, this definition is good. T-shaped designer is a specialist who has a lot of capabilities in other areas. T-shaped designers get their name based upon, based because of the stem or the vertical line of the T, which represents their expertise in one area, while the top, the horizontal line, symbolizes related skills in a broad number of areas. So I think this is a great image uh, here that can break it down. Um, so, you know, your breadth of knowledge across multiple different areas, right? Wing discipline, but you have your core discipline, core skill expertise. So myself, as a prime example of this, 
I would have my UX design, product design skill that would that would go deep. And then across that, I would have like marketing, strategy, videography, photography, marketing, content design, SEO, branding, etc. That would be on a kind of broad level. And you have this deep product design, deep UX design skill set, which I've possessed and grown over the years. So one, that's one thing at a junior level, you want to go deep into the design skill, but be able to cross have cross disciplines that relate to that core skill that make you an even stronger more impactful designer as well so when we talk about will ai replace designers uh, or will a will ai replace product designers will ai replace ux designers one of the key things you've got to do is make sure you have a breadth of skill and you have a depth of skill as well so you can kind of see it here in this visual here that I found quickly, uh, research, UI, prototyping, visual design, coding, writing, etc. Somebody might have general knowledge in these areas, but has this real deep visual design, motion design or skill to them as well. And this is a reflection of how you can stand out in uh, the industry, how you can actually make sure you're employable going forward is because you have depth, but you have broad knowledge and that depth and broad knowledge combined with your ability to uh, network as well will make you a much more effective uh, individual specifically as you grow in your career so you want to make sure that you're networking you're also meeting recruiters you're meeting other designers in industry as you grow but fundamentally at this moment uh, it's a broad range and then you got right the way down to like design lead here working uh, in government uh, 180,000 you got remote job 159,000 you've got um startup here 148,000 for user research uh you've got ux ui designer 129,000 129,000 for tech industry sometimes government campaign as well uh you've got some large tank company 120,000 so the range of, that you can get paid as a designer is quite broad have a good conversation with the recruiter you're working with step out and go forward all right so another thing i want to touch on as we go forward is still talking about this design area is the kind of um, this article that posted by Yahoo Finance, which says money fears have gone, have money fears have 46% of Gen Z working a side gig new study shows. Uh, this was quite interesting. So I went into it a bit deeper and I just want to touch on it so you can see side hustles are a good way to make extra cash. But more people, especially younger generations, are working another job just to make ends meet. A Deloitte, a new Deloitte survey shows that 46% of Gen Zs and 37% of millennials across the globe currently have a full or part-time job additional to their main one. CNBC made it reported in both generations more people have side jobs than a year ago and 3% higher among Gen Z, 4% higher among millennials. Some side jobs are on the rise for Gen Zs and millennials as they struggle to make ends meet. While money is a top reason for having a side job, respondents also see it as a way to monetize their hobbies, unplug from their primary job and expand their networks, and in some cases develop, and develop skills for a new career, a new career path. And this is why, uh, as we go forward, one of the key things I wanna to touch on is what we call skill stacking. And what we're seeing here is this fundamental shift where the economy is causing an environment that is making it kind of uh, the top of mind thing, thinking for Gen Z coming out of university, you know, they have high level debt like me. I came out of uni, I had close to 20,000 pounds worth of debt. Uh, I had to be able to um, try and get a job, but then it was a recession. I sent out over 400 CVs. I remember getting four responses and of those four responses, I still had to pay to get to a job that I got in the end. And that was for an architecture firm. I studied architecture at uni and then I went to this firm and then before you know it, I'm still having to pay to get there. So how did I make money? Now the way I made money to get there was by teaching myself web design and working with clients on the side doing 500 pound, thousand pound websites. And then I had to learn branding on top of that as well. And this is why I talked to you about skill stacking. And we're going to talk about myself, but I'm going to show you from this example. Let me just go deeper into it so you can see. Obviously, we touched on the design salaries, but um, I, I want to show you in this example here. Let me just scroll down quickly. 
ah, let's look at this example here from Kevin Hart. Um, Kevin Hart is a prime example of this. So if you check out Kevin Hart quickly, everyone knows Kevin Hart, comedian, extraordinaire. Uh, in, in, when he first started um, in the early days of his career, stand up was the kind of foundational skill that he developed. Then Kevin Hart took that skill and then he put small, small movie roles on top of that. And from those small movie roles that he had, he still was doing stand up, getting small gigs here and there. Then he was also, as you can imagine, crafting the public speaking skill through stand up. And then also he would do events and stuff like that as well. From there, comedy tours, small, but still impactful while he's still doing stand up. So you see in this consistent stack, from there, he starts to create content through just not just those small movie roles, but his own movies, then moving into the actual movie creation and then content creation. We see it with his YouTube channel online. Then we go, obviously, now, now move from movies into movie star. From movie star, he now has to understand the legal, the ownership side of it. So he has a slice of the pie as a contract owner deal structure and how to structure deals. I remember watching his Netflix documentary and he's talking about how he's now structuring deals and how he makes deals the best way uh, for himself so that he doesn't get swindled like many comedians have had it done to them in the past. Then he moved into this kind of global tours. You can see, so he's got a team, he's in his own company. He's starting to do global tours. On global tours, we see team management because now he's moving into a business owner, CEO role and being able to manage teams and then we can see him now moving into that business leader, producer, and then fundamentally the mogul, Kevin Hart. So now you, he didn't start off as the mogul, right? And he didn't start off as a business director or business leader. He didn't start off in team management. But that underlying skill set of stand up has been the foundational skill that he's built upon to stack and stack and stack and stack skills to now him becoming the mogul, Kevin Hart. And this is something I want you to really understand. I've seen this kind of journey in my own. I'm not Kevin Hart, by the way, to those who are here. No way am I a comedian. But we can see through team management, recruitment, stakeholder management, roadmap development, uh, managing people. And then obviously business leader, he's the visionary, leading other servant leadership, etc. And over my career, one of my core skill sets that I've been building alongside design skill is to be ability to present my work to speak in public to stand in front of people and not be afraid to communicate my ideas and things like that now doing youtube has been a fundamental thing that has really helped me in that context i'm also from a church background i grew up in church so going to church speaking on stages in church presenting in front of people preaching etc has also added to that as well so when you combine that with my design skill and i present in front of people I have the ability to communicate very well. And that is not because of my own help. It's because over the years, people given me opportunity. Now, one of the key things I also did early on in my career is I had a side hustle when I first started as a designer. So I was freelancing as a designer. And then I remember I just found this uh, Vimeo page here where you can see some of like my old videography work that I used to do when I was a freelance wedding and wedding designer. And then sometimes I get called to do um, like photography jobs as well. I remember I do photography jobs and you can see here, this is like, what was this again? This was, sorry, sorry for the This was a job that I did for someone where it was literally just their wedding day. And I was just like doing their pictures as well. Um, here, this was me doing something for Advent Shelter for a church, Southern Day Adventist Church that I'm part of. And then this was all around a homeless shelter during the Chris during the Christmas. I did a video for them to showcase how they help the homeless and stuff like that. So these are key things I wanted to show you because I want to show you it's not about where you start. Now, why do I say that? I was doing this freelance, but me learning the skills of videography led and built, helped me with my YouTube channel to know how to build a YouTube channel. And that combined with my design skill, combined my ability to present also now starts to stack up. So 2011, I graduate from uni. Graphic design is the thing I know because I studied architecture at uni and I had to graphically present my work. So I'd use my graphic design skill to do kind of posters, flyers, etc., for people. Then it moved from there to start doing photography for people because I'd need to do photography at times to help me with the graphic design work. And then that led me to doing videography. 
because I just was really interested in video. Me and my friends started a YouTube channel in 2011 slash 2012. Um, and then that allowed us to like talk, do talk about what we were doing through church and ministry and everything like that. That led to also me starting my own personal YouTube channel, speaking to designers. Then I had to learn how to brand myself and brand other companies I was working in, working with as well, which then led to web design because then I would have to create websites for the clients that I was working with. And this all kept building and stacking and growing. And before you know it, I'm learning SEO and digital marketing. I'm having to think strategically and learn strategy. There's some fantastic books that I've got. If you ever wanted to know some books on strategy, I'm having to learn sales and the ability to sell myself from stage, as well as the ability to sell myself to others and learn how to sell. And I'm still building that skill, all of these skills. And then I'm having to learn to generate leads and bring people in. Um, obviously, public speaking, I've spoken to you about that as well. And then management and managing people now I'm building my skills of leadership to be able to lead others. And then we see the advent of AI. So can AI really replace us? Maybe in some sense, who knows what the future will bring? I don't know what the future will bring. But one thing I am aware of is that as you st stack your skills, as you grow your skills bit by bit, you can then be in a much stronger place for whatever the future may bring. And we don't know what the future may bring, but what I can say is your ability to have a mindset of stacking skills means that when you see emergent technology, when you see new things, new shifts in the market, it's more of a mindset to say, wow, what opportunity, what an opportunity to learn a new skill, all right? So even now me managing people, specifically recruitment, stakeholder management, roadmap development, managing people. Now I'm not doing it to the level that Kevin Hart is similar to what I showed you prior, but it's still the same skills, but just within a different context at a smaller uh, business whether it's my own or someone else's, uh, the ability to manage people is a fantastic skill to gain. And then from the leadership side, I've been able to, in my church capacity, be able to do that on a personal outside of work. But now in my workspace, they're giving me more opportunity to be able to set vision, set direction and grow as well. So this is why, whether it's your own business, whether you're working in someone else's business or whether you're doing it on the side through something that you uh, really enjoy or some hobby, this kind of going forward and doing something new is super helpful and super essential as well. So I kind of wanted to touch on this quote um, that I saw and it said, this was by Clement Beauchart, who's a business consultant and growth market. He said, the proliferation of AI means that anyone can now build their own tools on top of ready-made models, but essentially everyone has access to the same data. So slapping in front of on the front end and saying chat GPT or GPT-3 will no longer be a competitive advantage. So it won't be enough to create a long lasting AI based company. So the realms, the real arms race is around training models and fine tuning them to serve a very specific use case. This relies on access to some kind of, look at the words here, exclusive or difficult to obtain data. For instance, whoever can gain access to private proprietary data sets that no one else uses and then trains a model with this data set to generate some kind of unique output will stand a better chance. So even though I do possess the skills that you see, I understand that working with companies who have unique data and that can, are trying to combine it with AI and then I come in as a designer to help them represent that data to their core user base, in a way that's unique and specific to that organization will help me going forward. And then also learning how to use and manipulate and track that AI and help senior leaders think strategically and make better decisions will help me long-term in the future. Now, we don't know if it will replace, there may be a need for replacement, who knows, but we have a, I have a combination of skills that I've stacked over the years to fall back on as well. So we don't look at AI in the context of fear. We look at it in a context of, okay, there are things that could be uh, used in a negative way. But the key thing for this conversation is how can we use this? How can we stack our skills when we look at others who in, even in other uh, industries who are doing really well, I see it like how have they leveraged their opportunities to grow and to develop and to become something better as well. So I share all of this with you to say, look, I don't know if AI will replace. I don't know, right? Um, if I'm just being completely honest and transparent, I do not know. 
Like, <laughs> I don't have the answers. But what I can say, if you leverage OpenAI, if you leverage ChatGPT, we can see that there's a plethora of tools now on the market that are leveraging this. But if you can use it to help you and assist you, then this will help you in such an amazing way. And if I look at my current tech stack that I'm just currently using, um, ChatGPT, I sometimes use it to help me create content. I also use ChatGPT to say, all right, like, um, give me an idea of demographics, psychographics for certain users to help me kind of have a starting position when I'm having certain conversations. Uh, Figma now over time is going to start embedding AI within their product. We know that I'm always using Adobe Premiere. I'm going to use it to edit this video, for example. I'm always using G Suite and they're going to ha have AI embedded in soon. And um, I'm using Keynote to present on today, but I could have used Google Slides as well. Um, just, you know, use Keynote for years. So this is kind of like a personal tech stack. There's other tools I'm using as well, but not as much as these uh, key tools that you see here. And the reason why I share it with you is because it doesn't matter the tool. It's about you, the designer, and how you're going to use it to help you going forward. So I just want to share this with you. Um, I really hope that really helps. And one of the key things I want everyone here to understand is that you can definitely do so much going forward. And as you go forward, you really need to think carefully about how you stack your skills and how you learn and what you can learn in a very, what we say, divergent way. Let me just... Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and what you can learn in a way that helps you going forward. So if you'd love to know more, just uh, I've got, got it here. Visit my website, uh, leifwallace.com. Um, I'd love for you to just hit me up, go to my website. You've got a link there to email me. So my email is hello at leifwallace.com. Hello at leifwallace.com. Send me an email, get in touch with me. Thanks so much for watching this video today and look after yourself and your